Hello and welcome. My name is Chris Holmes, Editor-at-Large for CIO, and I will be your host today. I'm pleased to be talking to Frankie Shui, former Director of Cyber and Technology Risk at UBS, as part of our Tech Leaders in Conversation discussion. So, Frankie, thanks ever so much for joining us today. So there's really three areas we want to discuss. The first one is your career, you know, and how you've actually come to be a tech leader um, and also to get into that sort of um, uh, uh, the jump you made from being on the technology vendor side to actually joining financial institutions become uh, you know on the end user side secondly to really talk about technology management and third to talk about people leadership so maybe you can just start by giving us a little bit of background about your career to begin with thanks Chris first of all I would say thank you the ideas be here or receive your CIO award in 2022 while I was a director of cyber and tech risk in UBS. And prior to that, I was also with Citibank, Microsoft, and HP. So all in all, I have about 20 years diverse leadership experience in both IT and the financial industry. So let me share where I am today and where I started. So academically, my education background actually was engineering background. I studied my bachelor degree in electric engineering in National University of Singapore here, and a master degree also in the same field from Nanyang Technological University here. So the good thing about the university system in Singapore here is the education is a very broad actually coverage. So that even as engineering students, we have a lot explored to the computer, to the IT, from the software programming to the computer networking. So that's why it's quite a seamless experience for us to join the IT world after graduation. So after joining IT world for a few years, actually I grow and learn quite a lot from the system design to the project management, from team management to the external client engagement. Obviously, that kind of experience is very useful and benefit me until today, not just on the technology side, but also the experience on the people engagement. People engage with both internal stakeholders and external clients as well. After spending a few years in the IT world, I am fortunate to join IT to the financial industry, still IT related. The first bank I joined, it was Citibank. So just now you asked about the difference between actually the IT and financial industry. I would say, let me share one quote here while I was in Citibank. At the time, our group CEO, Michael Beck, he shared one statement. It is, Citibank is not a bank. It is an IT company with banking license. So this statement is aspiring. So yes, it's true. A lot of IT industries, actually after a lot of IT industry talents, they have moved away from IT to the financial and still leverage whatever the expertise they have built in the IT world. And a lot of actually the banks or financial institutions, they have hired so many IT talents in Singapore and in the region here. And uh, financial industry is also a large, actually, player to adopt new technology from old days, the ATM machine to online banking, from mobile banking to the high frequency trading, from the blockchain asset tokenization to the machine learning AI usage. All this kind of, actually, the new use case and the showcase of how financial industry has been adopts new technology. As you may know, sorry, that, sorry. Let me just, uh, so, Frankie. That's very, very interesting. That that that's great to hear. So, I'm also interested as to what got you interested in security. Okay, great question. As you may know, IT has many subdomains. Security is part of the domain. There is an interesting area we have seen. A lot of actually, the tech service has been expanding when the whole world enter the digital world, going to the digital transformation, especially during the past few years, during COVID pandemic time, people are working from anywhere, using any device at any time, connect to the network, the internet world, so-called AAA. So the involving of the technology from cloud computing to AI, from blockchain to quantum computing, on one side, create a new opportunity, new use case, but on one side, create more digital touch points increase more attack service. That's why as a cybersecurity professionals, we are more busy than ever. It's interesting, but challenging areas. But on another side, 
there's also more sophisticated cyber attacks in the past few years. There's no denying that. While we are on the digital trans transformation journey, actually those bad guys, they are also on their digital transformation journey. They may also use AI and machine learning to as, actually as a weapon to make their attack is more personalized to you. Many years ago, you may receive web phishing email type to you, trick you to go to some fake website, provide a login pro no credential. That may be written by a real guy sitting in front of a PC, type the email to you. Nowadays, all this work actually could be done by robotics, could it be, could it be powered by the AI and the machine learning. And it is true that they can study you very well. They will do personalization study on you to connect all your networks around you, connect your personal life, connect your professional experience so that make this kind of the email, phishing email very personalized to you. This is called spear phishing. So, so that we have to tackle this kind of increased challenge. Fantastic. So I don't, I don't want to ask you who's winning, whether it's the attackers or whether it's the security, uh, because I think that's just going to be a constant battle that we're going to see going on for, uh, well, forever, really. But um, I think you bring up some very interesting points there, and it's a nice segue into our next conversation, which is really about managing new technology. I mean, we've seen, uh, you mentioned sort of quantum computing, you mentioned uh, AI, you know, we've got uh, chat GPT, we've got uh, generative AI uh, all over the news as we, as we, uh, as, as we speak today. Um, you know, how do you as a technology leader, a technology professional, really decide which technologies are worthwhile investigating and investing in um, for your organization? Okay, thanks for the question. So the technology is enabler and uh, it's shaping our future. So it is right time now. It, it is not yesterday, it's, it is not tomorrow. It is today that adopts new technology. That's one thing that if you cannot beat your enemy, you will be either part of them or be part of them so that you can win them. So this is actually the game, this kind of the win-win game here to adopt the new technology. Since I'm in the financial industry, people might think financial industry is a slow adopter of new technology. So those are big IT innovation actually is not from financial industry. It is not true. Look at the ATM machine. It was invented 50 years ago by the financial industry. Citibank, was the first global bank at the time, largely deployed the first ATM machine networks in the New York City in the US. And in the past 50 years, it has bring a huge convenience for the people. And ask your grandfather, grandmother, in the old days, how they deal with those cash. Every month after the salary bill day, they have to rush to the bank branch to queue for the long queue to get the money out, pay the bill, and remember, in the old days, those bank branch is not operating 24 by seven, and there's a limited number of branches in the city. So the, the inconvenience is there. With the invention of ATM machine, people could easily do a cash deposit, cash withdrawal, bank challenge, all these kind of the basic financial transactions at the ATM machine. You do not have to rush to the branch. People nowadays, people may think, oh, ATM still is old. Everything we're doing is online. We're using smartphone, we're using application. We can do seamless payment, seamless transaction. But do not forget in the past 50 years, how much more convenience ATM machine has brought to us, has brought to the financial industry. This is just one example. And similarly, like the first generation iPhone Apple has generated, or the current, the ChatGPT integration, the real value has bring to us. So all this kind of disruptive technology has really bring the new value, new, actually the market entry for us, and not just IT, but also financial industry as well. Just look at the ChatGPT. They have accumulated 100 million users within two months. To reach this kind of 100 million users for TikTok, they have spent nine months. For Instagram, they have spent two and a half years. So now back to the question, as an IT leader, how do we identify and keep up with this kind of new technology? Simple advice I could think of is just do not go for something because of it is something. Here something could be any buzzwords, cloud, blockchain, 
or ChatGPT, you have to find the real value behind the real use case you could adopt in your organization. Then look into how to integrate this kind of things into your whole ecosystem. One organization may claim, okay, we have X, Y, Z percentage of our systems and data on the cloud. We are the leader in the cloud migration. Another organization say, no, we are the organization. We built everything from the cloud, may use of the cloud advantage of the AI, be the machine learning, robotics automation. So actually there's a difference of these two kinds of the organization. For the first one, I share the one real actually practical example here. We know for the, for the IT systems, on the one system, there are many subcomponents from database to web server, from the production instance to testing instance. You may just put one component out of the 100 components of this system into the cloud while remaining 99% still remain on-premise. You claim, oh, my system is cloud on the cloud. Yes, it's true. But the fact is you still have 99% of the workloads on-premise. You have to still have to do cut those kind of the, actually the traditional work maintenance on your traditional database, on a traditional data center. And there's a great additional, actually the challenge for you to manage the data communication on the cloud and off the cloud, encryption and decryption and all kinds of things. So you have not really unlock the value of cloud computing could bring to you. There's actually the, the cloud native advantage like the automation data analytics, all this you have not fully utilized. So th that's one thing about cloud migration, the pro proper planning. Another thing about cost management. Although cloud service provider may tell you, their usage, the, the building model is pay as usage. You just pay whatever you have put and running on the cloud. Sounds great, but do as the IT leader, we surely have to sit down, look at all the things you have put on the cloud, whether if they are still running, but there's, if there's no business value behind, there's no business case, your IT resource is just running for itself. That's a waste of money. That's why your CFO may come to you every month. Why your club bill is so high? Why it keep increasing? You have to justify, you have to break it down, tell your CFO, your car migration is really bring the economic value to the organization. It's not just go for cloud, because it is the cloud. Same thing, not only apply for the cloud migration, but also for other things like blockchain tokenization, like chat, chat GPT integration. You really have to sit down and find the real use case and then scale up, find more use case for the organization. Really bring the value to your business, to your clients. Increase the CX, UX. Increase CX means for your customer experience. UX means uh, internal employee use experience. So that your people will really think technology department, IT department is an enabler, is a partner for them. It's not just, okay, help desk or showstopper or call center. So very interesting there. So, I mean, how do you, how do you yourself keep abreast of those newer technologies? I mean, you know, um, do you go out and listen to seminars? Do you, do you, do you, um, you know, regularly engage with vendors and get them to update you on what's going on? I mean, how, how, how do you actually identify what are those technologies that you should be looking at and considering? For me personally, I always believe sharing is learning. Leadership is not siloed. So I, I would like to make use of time. It's not the back time because we know we're all busy. Use a fragmented time slots. Try to read those, those kinds of new articles and new blocks to understand what the things going on, what are people getting the people's eye, and what's the the use case they have actually the thing in the industry. The link to my daily work that's very important. The linkage to my daily work and I think whether it could be adopted partially or fully. I talk to my partners, stakeholders in the company, as well as my partner networks in the industry, so that it's a two-way communication. So that share whatever I have learned, whatever I have experienced. Also listen to them, what's the good story, use case they have shared, so that as a community, so we could grow together. 
Oh, very interesting. And then that brings me into the conversation around actually bringing that new technology into into the roadmap, you know, and actually making sure that that roadmap, you know, is taking in the uh, the business requirements, but it's also having that sort of the the, the, the newer technologies coming in. And again, we, we, we're we starting to see a lot more conversation around this idea around sort of, um, you know, business pull. So business saying we want to be able to achieve these particular use cases, but even more so this idea of technology push where we start to see newer technologies enabling different use cases that the business may not have actually considered so how do you uh, organize that and manage that uh, in, in, in your in your experience so this is a two-way communication traditionally actually it's a one-way communication business will have the use case then they will have the FIT functional requirements documentation passed to the IT the IT, based on business requirements, we come up with IT design plan. Then we do the development, testing, then roll out. That's a traditional workflow project management model. But now more cases we have seen is another way, which means especially for this kind of new technology coming to the picture is IT, they adopt new technology. They do some sandbox, then find some use case. Then they sell internally to the business user saying, okay, there's something new. So we would may need to spend more money. This is a small use case in the sandbox. We do some demonstration to you, see whether it can fit into our business ecosystem to come up with a new business product or new business model. So that most of the time, business partners, they were quite keen to listen and attend this kind of seminars and the conference in the dialogue with IT partners, because they know actually if just using the current, actually the IT technology, IT infrastructure, whatever the business product is actually is horizontal or maybe this kind of the growth, linear growth. If you want to have exponential growth or breakthrough, really you need to find some new technology could bring the value to you. That's why they also want to listen and sit down with the IT partners. That's why I see this kind of two-way communication more and more happening now. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, and I think that's a very interesting point about looking for that, um, well, let's call it transformational growth, you know, the digital transformation uh, journey that so many organizations are actually on. But I think there's also something, um, again, you talked about the two-way conversation, something about the, the education side of things as well. Because again, there's a lot of hype out there as to what the technologies are capable of. And again, I, I've been seeing a lot of conversations, been involved in a lot of conversations, which is really talking about uh, talking to the business about what the technology is capable of, but also what the technology is not capable of. There's that kind of education. Yes, oh, great. So do not be too negative. So we have to acknowledge the constraints, but next turn, try to see, not just talk what cannot be done when you talk to the business. It's more like what can be done how can be done? It's more to get the engagement, it's more positive. And another thing actually I can share here is about the shift, the mindset shift for our IT leaders from the project-based IT management or planning to the business product or business service focused IT planning. And personally, I'm not against the typical IT project management. Actually, maybe you know, I was a vice president of project management student Singapore chapter. So PMI actually is a global institute to issue the PMP certification, which is the most recognized actually project management certification worldwide. So I'm a strong advocate of project management, but things has been changed, situation has been changed. We cannot use always just look at, okay, time cost, uh, IG, red amber, green status of the project, then do the dashboard, do the presentation to the management. That's the old ways ID project leaders, they used to do, to be honest, I'm also part of the, a few years ago. But nowadays, as I say, the world is changing. And the, for the business, the product, time to market is very short time. We have to be agile, we have to be nimble, we have to do more with less. So that as IT leaders, we should think how our, our IT project is put into the business side and more aligned to their product and service. And uh, how to increase the UX user experience or CX client experience. I know it's hard to measure all the things we're doing. It's unlike the old ways to do the project management, but the more you can do this kind of the linkage and the more language you speak in the shoes of your business partners and clients, 
the more easy you will get actually the conversation with them. And it's more easy later on when you want to actually plan for your IT budget. So it's the chain effect here. So we really have to think out of our box how to move our, our I'd say, not just the IT guys only. We should be part of the IT business world nowadays. So much more integrated, much more yeah, tightly great. connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and uh, it's something I'm I'm hearing a lot and hearing a lot of conversations around this, how to break down those barriers and how to have that integration. I mean, it's interesting. As soon as we talk about IT, there's almost a barrier being drawn around that. But we're actually saying we need to move beyond that. Yes. So, Frankie, um, just coming on to the third part of our conversation, and that's about um, leadership in, the, in this uh, uh, period of uncertainty. I mean, you know, the, the banking, the financial industry is going through some um, challenges, literally, again, as we speak. I mean, just in the last week, two weeks, there's been a, 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 a bit of concern across the, across the industry. So, you know, how have, how have you as a technology leader, you know, kept the team focused, kept the team motivated? Thanks for the question. So, to be honest, it's challenging nowadays. It's not just IT industry, it is overall world. So, there's certain things we cannot control, we have to acknowledge as IT leader. For example, we can forecast the interest rate, but we cannot control the interest rate, right? How much the base point they want to increase. But within our boundary as IT leaders, there are a lot of things we can do. So, first is mindset change. I know a lot of people we will describe us as a manager, IT manager. To be honest, there's nothing wrong about this description of management, but I would more prefer the word leader, leader, IT leader. It's more, for me, it's more important than IT manager. Why? For the manager, it's more like the top-down approach. Okay, you get the direction or instruction from the top, layer by layer, cascade down, tell the ground staff to do certain projects, then just focus on execution. That is a top down, that is deep, the all the ways, the, the management. But for the leader, the leadership actually is a two way. You have the top down approach, communication, but you also have the bottom up approach, bottom feedback. And then you have the strong team bonding and you have the, actually the continuous feedback, continuous appreciation to your staff. By the way, this appreciation should not be just once a year before the year end appraisal. It should be a continuous journey during the project, at the end of projects, beginning of the projects, anytime, once you start doing something great, doing something actually achieve or beyond your expectation, you should not, should not actually be silent. You should be more energetic and should cheer this kind of achievements from staff. Another thing as a leader we should do is as a translator, a good leader is a good translator to translate your company's mission, vision, strategy to the ground staff's execution so that the ground staff, they will feel powerful. They will feel whatever they do on a daily basis is part of the big picture. They know their contribution is part of the, gr the group achievement in the direct way or indirect way. So this kind of the communication and the feedback is very important. Another thing is about the training. Training is we know as a leader, every year we have to spend some time on the budget for the training, for the staff training, for the technology training or soft skill training. So do not constrain ourselves into the classroom training, those kind of formal training only. There's one famous rule in the industry about, it's called 70, 20, and 10 rule. It means effective training is composed of 70% OJT and job training, 20% mentorship, informal training and the remaining 10% is a formal training either in the classroom or online led by the professional trainer. So make use of this all kinds of trainings, not just the last 10%, but the first 20, 70%, 20% so that empower your staff to do this kind of the job training explorer, to, not just on the technology side, but on the soft skill side so that it could be more resilient, be relevant especially in the current uncertainty environment. And the last but not least, the leader, and we should also take care of our staff's the cares, not just physical cares, but also the mental cares. As a leader, we should set our own self as a good example. So I may be not a good example, but some, some personal experience I can share is, I like the outdoor sports. 
So it really make me feel energetic during the work and take away the stress to a certain extent. So I'm the full marathon uh, race finisher. And I'm also the, actually the Asia highest sprint jump finisher a few years ago. So that's really make me as I say, energetic in the work. So when I face the kind of, this kind of challenge. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. And I think there's some uh, very, uh, very uh, good ideas and good tips. And again, I think that that one of actually um, the staff mirroring how you actually act, um, that's much more powerful than being told what to do. Um, so, yeah. So, Frankie, thank you ever so much. We've come to the end of today's conversation. Uh, again, I'd like to just, you know, say thank you for sharing your career journey, you know, your, your thoughts and thinking on how to sort of manage technology going forward and also your guidance on leading in this uh, era of uncertainty. My name's Chris Holmes. I'm editor at large for ASEAN CIO and I've been talking to Frankie Schwa as part of our Leadership in Technology series. If anyone's got any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn.